Today's video is going to be on a brief history of FFA. If you notice the timeline I have here, I want you to look at some of the, the eras that, that uh, the FFA has experienced over, over time. For instance, if we take a look at 1917, this was to establish money for public uh, schools and agriculture in particular. Father of the FFA creed, and uh, during that time there was a lot of other things going on. Creeds and colors adopted, purchase of George Washington State, and so on. So as you um, listen to this video, I want you to also take a look at what was going on at that time as, as far as not only our country, but also what, what some of the eras were. Because definitely in each of the decades or in, in, in some of those years, there was definitely some commonality amongst it. So we're going to uh, find that out in just a moment. So as you're uh, going through this uh, video, it's really important to note the date as well as the people are involved because it's the people who really made the difference. And they were all very passionate about passing on their knowledge and their wisdom about agricultural education. First started, of course, in 1928. The very first president was Leslie Applegate. Here's a picture of him, as you can see. And he was elected by 33 members that represented 18 states in the Hotel Baltimore in Kansas City, Missouri. And it's, it's really uh, important to note that there was a very kind of a small organization. Uh, however, it was catching on quite rapidly. But before this could happen, some other things had to kind of go in place. So let's kind of go back in time. First of all, it was 1917, and we were in the Great Depression. And one of the, the, the biggest problems uh, in the United States was our, not only our failing economy, but the other reason it was failing is because our farms were failing. Um, due to uh, poor cultivation practices like rotational, uh, uh, rotating crops and taking care of the soil and a drought on top of it, our food systems were also failing. So we needed to, to establish a good agricultural research as well as good agricultural um, education. So at that particular time, what we had is the Smith-Hughes Act was passed. The federal government said, look, we got it provide money for public education so they can offer agriculture courses in the public school setting. And we had uh, two gentlemen, a congressman and a senator from uh, Georgia's, Georgia, and they provided funding by this particular piece of legislation called the Smith-Hughes Act of 1917. They're the, the forerunners of today's Carl's Perkins money, and they were establishing vocational training um, in public schools. Then also, uh, shortly after that, in 1920, a gentleman by the name of Henry Grossclose established and laid down a kind of a, a, a formula, if you will, uh, of what FFVs, or Future Farmers of Virginia's, um, because throughout that time, they, as these clubs were starting to form uh, in these high schools, they called them Aggie Clubs. And these Aggie Clubs were the forerunners of today's FFA chapters. But Henry Grossclose came up with, with ideas on, on how to um, make things extremely accessible to students. Uh, he uh, put together uh, consistency in judging teams. And this was going to lay the groundwork uh, for what was going to happen in about eight years for the future farmers of America. So he was, he's been credited as the one to kind of lay down that, that, um, um, that road work for us. And then in 1930, um, what we, we have is the Third National Convention convenes. And when it does, uh, they adopt something written by E.M. Tiffany. It was called the FFA Creed. It gave them direction. It gave them a purpose. And it really changed very little ever since. Also, the colors, national blue and corn gold, were also adopted. But in 1933, something else took place. Dr. Gus um, Lintner uh, of Ohio came up with a design for a jacket because at that time they had kind of a funky little hat on their, their head. Uh, they had kind of a, a khaki shirt and it really wasn't very unifying and it wasn't very well um, uh, noticeable. So uh, Dr. Lintner came up with this, this plan and here's an example of, of one of those jackets. It was all pretty much hand stitched, very distinctive emblem um, w w with definitely meeting. A, a blue corduroy jacket, and it was a very distinctive look. It's iconic uh, now, and heck, these jackets sell for quite a bit now, these vintage, these vintage ones, even if they're faded and, of course, uh, torn a little bit. So in 1933, 
a group uh, from Ohio, I think it was Frederickstown, I believe it was, Ohio, came out for these jackets. Everybody had to have them, and they later were adopted as the official uniform. Then in 1939, uh, uh, FFA took a huge leap um, to establish itself as an organization, a national organization, with the purchase of George Washington's uh, 28 and a half acres, a part, portion of his estate in Alexandria, Virginia. This was going to be the future site of the headquarters as well as the FFA Center, so you purchase uh, uh, some of the paraphernalia you need to, to run a chapter. Um, but also at, at, uh, in 1944, we uh, also established the National Foundation. It was a group of, of volunteers, business people, etc., that, that would put together fundraising opportunities to raise money for scholarships and FFA activities throughout the United States. And, of course, then the National Supply Service was also formed so we could get all of our print materials, some of our awards, and our decorations. And here's a picture of, of course, the National FFA Center in Alexandria, Virginia. Again, a very kind of distinctive building. Uh, but it later uh, would become just kind of an, um, a companion site because uh, later on it would move. Then in the 1950s, um, in the 1950s, some more legislation came into play and it gave us our very three integral parts uh, or circles, if you will, of, of agricultural education. Public law was granted to the National FFA, FFA, which meant that all of its affiliates um, were federal charters. So in order for you to have a chapter, you'd have to actually apply for a charter, which means you'd have to have a set of, of, of officers, you'd have to have a uh, constitution, and, and etc. So that's why it takes about a year for a brand new chapter to kind of get, uh, get on board because they are, they've got to go through this process of getting a charter. But Public Law uh, 740 also stipulated these three uh, circles and basically a Venn diagram and where it lays out that the classroom is the site of instruction where you get your knowledge. Then on top of that, once you've kind of gotten that knowledge, uh, you have a supervised agricultural experience or SAE that has to do with you choosing the kind of project you would like to do. And then, of course, FFA is a component where they get leadership uh, from um, uh, the advisors as well as the activities and of course that little piece right in the center where it says agricultural education that's the sweet spot that way you have a a good balance of leadership training uh, of practical knowledge and of course academic knowledge as well and there it is now the other thing uh, happened in 1953 was the 25th anniversary of the FFA and it just so happens I have a block of these stamps, and um, actually they're, they're pretty valuable. Um, but the United States Postal Service minted these uh, stamps, and um, they were co they're commemorative stamps um, that I believe it were three cents each. So now they're uh, worth quite a bit more. And also in 1950, we had 1958 came along, and Dwight D. Eisenhower, the President of the United States, was the very first president to speak at the National Convention. And then um, as, uh, as time progresses, this was a kind of a, a really tough time as far as civil rights is concerned in the United States. But of course, uh, the National FFA uh, wanted to be a step ahead. And during this time, basically from 1930 to 1965, there was a parallel organization going on called the New Farmers of America. They're the African American, uh, African -American uh, uh, organization uh, for, for boys who wanted to become farmers, and so it was segregated. So he had the NFA and the FFA. And then in 1965, uh, they merged together, and they were, all became FFA, and pretty much uh, helped in some of the segregation in some of the schools. Obviously, in the South, it was a little bit different. But... Um, they merged, and, and then, of course, in 1969, just four years later, girls were admitted to the FFA. So uh, the 60s and 70s were times where there was going to be a lot of change, and in particular in the area of civil rights. Now, in 1973, kind of the theme for that is diversity and inclusion, because on the heels of those last two events in 1960s, the course continued, because now... Uh, African Americans are going to be starting to take their place um, primarily in leadership positions. 
Like, for instance, in 1973 at the 46th National Convention, Fred McClure from Texas was elected a, a national officer. And then in 1978, Jimmy Carter addresses the 51st National Convention. He was the first former FFA member uh, to become the United States president and, of course, uh, addressed um, the, um, the convention at that particular time. And then uh, 1982, uh, more change was going to happen. And in 1982, Jan Eberly from California, San Diego, I think it was Fallbrook uh, chapter, uh, elected their first national president, female president. So our first female national president was Jan Eberly, 1982. And then things were starting to be uh, starting to change quite drastically. Also at the, at the center, at the National FFA Center, uh, the New Horizons magazine uh, came out. It replaced the Future Farmer, uh, uh, Future Farmers of America uh, magazine. And it began to look at, in, uh, to urban uh, students, began to look at those non-traditional agricultural students and started to target them. And so you got a kind of a fresh, cleaner look to the, the magazine. And uh, then, like I said, in 1989, the National of Future Farms and Magazine changes to New Horizons. And also in 1988, um, we, the, we, we made The Tonight Show uh, because... Uh, 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 Johnny Carson kind of made fun because he was a, a former FFA member of the, the uh, National FFA organization. They changed their name from FFA to, well, FFA. Uh, but no longer did it, did it actually mean Future Farmers of America. They just changed it to FFA. And that was to, to reflect some of the growing diversity we had in agriculture at the time to open up the, uh, the doors and opportunities. Then in the 1990s, lots of things were changing. Uh, the F National FFA was moving uh, their center, moving some of their um, uh, some of their conventions as well. But also in 1994, our first African American uh, national uh, president, who also was an urban student, was elected uh, as president, and that's Corey Flournoy from Illinois. And then the website uh, first debuted in 1996. And the National FFA Center moved from Alexandria to Indianapolis, Indiana, where it is today. That was in 1998. And then in 1999, the last uh, convention of the decade, the uh, FFA convention actually uh, was held for the first time in, in Louisville, Kentucky, moving from its original home in Kansas City, Missouri. And, it, and of course, we said goodbye to them. I was, I, I was there in 1999, and I'd been in Kansas City as well. Just Kansas City just wasn't big enough anymore, and of course Louisville was was really uh, an, an eye opening. It, it it had a ter terrific venue, and uh, the students I had had a terrific time there. And then in 2000, we're still on the move, uh, but in uh, the uh, year 2000, we kind of embraced some of the seventh and eighth graders nationwide. Not so much in California, but on the East Coast and South, made a discovery degree for for the middle school. Uh, students, I was able to uh, be uh, involved a, on a national committee to make that happen. Couldn't make it in, uh, happen in California, however. In 2001, the first national star in agri-science. In, in th 2002, we had the very first female um, star farmer. And, of course, Javier Moreno um, uh, from Puerto Rico our first uh, is elected as national president. And he was the first Puerto Rican to be elected to that. And the first person uh, that had other than English as, as their native tongue or language was elected to president. And in 2005, uh, FFA launched the Seeds of Hope uh, to help a, f a fundraiser to help all the Gulf Coast states kind of rebuild their communities and in particular their, their agricultural programs. Then raised uh, well over um, $800,000. And then in 2006, for the very first time, we moved out of um, Louisville, Kentucky, and for the 79th um, annual FFA convention, uh, has been relocated to Indianapolis, Indiana. And it's been there ever since, but we're going to be moving, I think, back to Louisville, I think, in, uh, in 2013. To, uh, in 2007... Uh, we break half a million mark in, in terms of membership. It was well over 500,000 with over 7,300 chapters um, in the United States. And then, of course, uh, in 2009, um, we celebrated our 40th anniversary of women being admitted to the FFA. I hope this has given you some perspective of, of organization and allows you to um, 
take a look at all the accomplishments. The FFA has pretty much sta stayed in step with our, our national um, uh, themes, but also have been slightly ahead in terms of in inclusion and diversity. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this uh, video, and I hope you've been able to kind of start piecing together uh, our very proud and traditional history.